Well, I have first of all to say it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's the first time I've ever officially been on the grounds of the Queen's University of Belfast. So it is indeed something new for me. And what I'd like to do today is to introduce you to some of my thoughts on some aspects of the law of succession as it's practiced in Scotland. You'll see as I go on that uh, insofar as I'm able to make any comment on the common law and the law of succession, I really am a very much an innocent abroad. I, I can't say I understand the common law. And when we look over the border into England, it looks to us very much like a riot of ideas. So excuse my ignorance on that point. I'm going to stick to some areas that I hope will be of interest to you that relate to Scotland. and. What I'm going to talk today in particular about is the age-old issue of the heir and the matter of universal succession. Now, Scotland is a mixed legal system. We take quite a lot of our law from the law of Rome, particularly in relation to succession. And I'm going to start, really, a starting point is the digest of Justinian, a Book 50, 1762, where the Roman jurist Julian mentioned that the heir succeeds to the whole legal position of the deceased. Now, I'm not going to quote that provision to you, but that's a very well-known passage in civilian legal systems, and that includes Scotland. That means that the heir is the universal successor, not only in the sense of taking over the property of the deceased, but in the sense that he succeeds and hence represents the deceased in his legal relationship. Now, please note the two points. This is one of the great imponderables of the law of succession, involving notions that for too long have remained wrapped up in the mystery of Latin phrases, such as hereditas yakens. I don't know if that phrase is common in the common law, but it means the jumping heir or presumably ownerless property, property that seems to bounce about without an owner, immediately after death, and the phrase eadem persona cum defunctu, and that is a phrase meaning that the executor is the same person as the deceased. I want to examine how these themes operate in modern Scots law and to unpack some of these mysteries because they really are deeply dense in Scots law and they don't appear in much of our case law. I would say in that regard we benefit greatly from institutional writers in Scotland. So we actually have authority on matters not decided by the courts. We actually have a a system in which we have writers who write in a principled way and try and write about things that are not likely ever to come before the courts because they are, as it were, under the bonnet, but with a view to assisting the development of the law, institutional writers have set out these themes. Now, any examination of the laws of succession must start with the event of death. The event of death. For us in Scotland, a good part, point of departure is not English law. In fact, English law is completely obscure to us. A good point of departure is Prussian law. Now this is the now defunct German speaking state that produced some remarkable scholars and I want to draw your attention to the words of a scholar from Breslau, the second city of Prussia located in Silesia which is now in Poland. In 1891 C.E. Riesenfeld in his treatise Verschollenheit und Todeserklärung nach Gemeinen und Preußischem Recht which means absence and declaration of death in general and Prussian law introduced his work with a sentence in the handout that I've just given you, and it is, The Tod des Menschen ist eine Tatsache, die auch für das Recht Bedeutung haben kann. Durch ihn vollzieht sich die Entstehung, Änderung und Endigung von Rechten. Now what that means in translation is, as I've given you, the death of a man is a fact that can have significance for the law. Upon death, rights may arise, alter and terminate. Now this quotation contains a truth valid for all legal systems, civil based or common law based. Natural death is a factual occurrence that has important legal consequences. Civil death is a legal fiction intended to mimic natural death that regards some or all of those consequences. Only one of these possible consequences is the requirement to distribute the estate of the deceased. Only one of the consequences actually is the engagement of the law of succession. The estate of the deceased is itself varied by death. One of our institutional writers, Professor Bell, one of our last institutional writers in the 19th century, asserts 
that death in the context of succession means natural and not civil death. But both the fact of death and the legal fiction of civil death have relevance for the law of succession. That, that natural death is not the only key to the opening of the law of succession was recognised by the European Court of Human Rights where it was observed in the case Marx against the Kingdom of Belgium nearly 30 years ago. And for the sake of embarrassment, I'm not going to attempt to destroy a, the amitié between the old alliance of Scotland and France by trying to pronounce this French, but I'll give you the translation of it. It is death is central to the law of succession because it is the normal reason for succession to occur. The normal reason for succession to occur. Now, death may be the normal reason for succession to occur, but it is not the sole reason. It is more accurate to state that the fact of natural death is central to the operation of the law of succession, and by contrast, the legal fiction in its various guises is relatively marginal, but is nonetheless of interest. In that regard, I would draw to your attention that they in one of the rare occurrences of borrowings from the law of Scotland, again in a totally unacknowledged way, I understand the law of Northern Ireland has brought in a Presumption of Death Act recently. It's almost completely Scots law. We've had this since 1977. It's a huge improvement on English law. It's, your law is now almost completely Scots law and has been utterly unacknowledged. But it is a good statute nonetheless. And it makes some improvements on Scots law, so well done. Death has relevance to the law of succession in a number of respects. Succession lawyers often leap immediately to the law of succession and the rules of division. However, there is an important prior stage, prior in time, to doing this. As the quotation from Prussian law indicates, death affects existing rights and obligations. A lawyer must identify this effect long before he can apply the laws of succession. Death therefore applies directly to persons and has inevitable, albeit in some cases more indirect effects, on property in the widest sense, comprising personal rights, obligations and real rights. And I'd like to address first of all the implications for the law of persons. And this is one of the biggest holes in Scots law. We don't have a textbook on the law of persons, nor do we have any writings on the law of persons. A, the last person to write anything about the law of persons that makes a lot of sense for the law of Scotland is Gaius. Right, persons. The problem with taking this law is that there really is nothing written on it. So identifying the basic principles are difficult. Some of them are remarkably obvious. First of all, only natural persons die, and they can die only once. As was observed rather obviously in a South African case, a dead person can't die. Except that is where you enter the parallel world where a person who has been declared civilly dead because he is missing, presumed dead, and then he actually does die. That is a dead person who dies. Consequently, the law of succession does not apply to the distribution of the property of dissolved juristic bodies. That's liquidation or striking off. A second implication of the law of persons is that death is certainly the last event in the life of the person concerned. However, it's a very different proposition to suggest that death terminates the legal personality of the deceased. There is much debate and some confusion as to what occurs on death to the legal personality of a natural person. And I want you, in the next quotation, again in French, and I'll refer you to my English translation, this is my own translation, there's an inherent tension in the view of the, the most important recent French writer on succession, Philip Mallory. And like everything else, he says it with enormous style. Read the French, there's tremendous style here, but it's utterly vacuous. Legal personality ends with death, which extinguishes the lifetime rights and debts of the deceased and transmits his state to those who continue his personality, the successors. Well, how on earth can legal personality end at death and then be continued? I'll read it again. Legal personality ends at death. Read to the end. These are the person who continue his personality, the successors. As is suggested in the first part of this quotation, death can be regarded as terminating the legal personality of a natural person. This is the approach that is accepted in some legal systems and philosophies and appears to be the case in some variants, for example, of law as different from our own as Islamic law. However, for the purposes of many other jurisdictions and the application of their laws of succession, exactly op the opposite is the case. As is suggested in the second part of the quotation, the rules of succession in many jurisdictions are framed on the basis that the personality of the deceased continues after death. And to adopt the words of 
Thomas Hobbes, again given as a quotation, this artificial eternity is that which men call the right of succession. The fiction of continued legal personality appears to be the accepted approach of Scott's law, in that the personality of the decuius, that's the person whose estate is under consideration, the decuius continues after death. At least that is until the estate of the decuius is distributed. His personality continues. Put another way, Scott's law operates as if the deceased is not dead and extends the endurance of his personality after death. At the very heart of Scott's law of succession is the pretense that the deceased is not dead. It's just like the wake for the deceased in rural Ulster where a drink is poured for the deceased and a seat at the table is set. The quests are enforceable against a deceased as if he had made promises at the point of death. Yet again, it's just like the Ulster Wake, because in that context, the deceased is regarded as having promised all the guests a drink. The continuance of personality after death appears initially somewhat strange. However, it is not at all surprising. It is in some measure a mirror image of the position of the unborn child who has legal personality to some extent and for some purposes before being born. After death of the decuius, the executor represents the decuius. Now that word is important. Represents the decuius in Scots law. Represents the deceased. And by virtue of a legal fiction, albeit only partially and not in full measure, is regarded as this phrase, eadem persona cum defuncto. In other words, the same person as the deceased. That is to say, the executor is regarded as being the deceased. Of course, if your dad dies and you become his executor, you do not become your own parent. The fiction has limited application. However, the fiction is nonetheless real and has an important purpose. A major and possibly the primary rationale of this rule is to lessen the economic disruption to those such as creditors who had legal relations with the deceased. The legal position occupied by the decuius, in other words the deceased, is kept unaltered as much as possible by setting the executor in his place. This is recognised in many legal systems in the civilian tradition, as is evidenced by the observation I found in a court case from another jurisdiction. Not England, not Germany, but Puerto Rico. This is the observation. It's in Spanish on the handout, if you wish. And I spent an entire afternoon translating this because I don't read Spanish. But Spanish is remarkably similar to Latin, and Spanish legalese is remarkably similar to Latin legalese, and it reads just like Scott's law. Succession whether it be testate or intestate, is one of the forms or means of acquiring or transferring the property and other rights and obligations of the decuius. Thus, in the careful organisation of the civil code, we don't have a civil code in Scotland, but we have a common law, not in the same measure, in the same sense as you have here, but in the careful organisation of the civil code, this quotation says, it is included in Book 3 that deals with the different forms of acquiring property. By this method, the rights and obligations of the defunct transmit to the heirs. This reflects the fact that our law of succession, which is founded on Roman law, so is ours in Scotland, is based on the principle that the juridical position occupied by the De Cuius is to remain unaltered so far as possible by means of putting the heir in place of the deceased. Thus it appears justified to assert that rather than being a phenomenon of acquisition, it is an issue of substitution of the owner or the continuation of the, his personality. And then he goes on to talk about different rights that actually don't transmit on death at all. Some rights don't transmit on death. They don't form part of the estate, and they just terminate on death. A life rent, which I think you call a life tenancy, for example, comes to an end on death. That's perfectly excusable. It doesn't form part of the estate. It terminates. Some rights actually don't form part of the estate at all. For example, a right to uh, enforce a public right of way. That doesn't form part of the estate at all. Everybody has that. Uh, it isn't subject to the law of conveyancing at all. Now, that quotation is lengthy. I apologise for the length of it, but it's deliberate. Much of that 
if not at all, is also true of Scott's law. Albeit one must accept that the universal successor recognised in modern Scots law is not the heir, but the executor. Furthermore, the underlying principles have been obscured to some extent in Scotland, first by the recognition of the executor as a trustee for the beneficiaries. Actually, I think the real role in Scotland started off that the executor was a fiduciary, not a trustee. And second, by the further transfer of the estate from the executor to the beneficiaries. The whole point of succession is not to transfer property to the executor, it's actually ultimately to transfer it to the beneficiaries. Now the third important issue on death is that until his acceptance of appointment there clearly is no executor. Such acceptance can occur only after the death of the deceased. Now that, however, does not mean that after his death the deceased is without personality in the gap period between death and the appointment of an executor. In such a case, the de curious, that's the deceased, remains like a disabled person, having no representative akin to a juristic body like an incorporated company without officers, no director, no secretaries. A company without director and secretaries is utterly disabled. It cannot act, and so too is a dead person. One further important consequence of this continuation of personality is that the property of the de curious does not become ownerless on death. The, be the beneficiaries just can't walk in and grab it because it is unowned. A dead person's property continues to belong to the dead person. It's theft for the beneficiaries to go in and take the property, or for anybody else for that matter to go in and take the property. It does not in Scotland vest in the crown. It's not on owner's property. It does not vest in any notion of a public trustee. Furthermore, it is not the case that the estate itself becomes a juristic person, a thing that gets personality in law. And this was recently confirmed judicially in Scotland in 2008 with the following quotation, which is on the handout. The estate of a deceased person is not a natural or juristic person. Rather, it is a fund of property vested in an executor for the purposes of administration, in respect of which debtors and beneficiaries have claims. It only vests on the death of the person in whom it was formerly. So just to repeat, the estate is not open to occupation by third parties as bona vacantia. The estate of the de curious is not owner's property. It does not vest in the crown in terms of the principle quod nullius est fit domini regis. Instead, the law of succession involves a process of conveyancing whereby the ownership of the estate of the de curious requires to be dis distributed by the transfer from the deceased person who continues to own it after his death to the relevant beneficiaries. That conveyancing, however, can take place only when the executor, as representative of the deceased, has been appointed and confirmed. Now, I don't want to go into enormous technical detail about that because... It is obscure in Scots law, simple as that. And there are some contrary views, I hasten to admit that. This is my view. But I want to continue in relation to debts. The continued personality of the deceased is perhaps more clearly exhibited in relation to debts. A creditor does not need to reconstitute his debt after the death of the debtor. Nor does the deceased require to acknowledge the debts in his will. The debt remains payable just as it was prior to death. Albeit a trustee for beneficiaries, the executor, or a mortis cause a trustee, is not a trustee for creditors. Upon the death of his debtor, a creditor in a debt does not become a beneficiary in a trust obligation. Where a debt of the deceased remains payable after his death, it remains as a debt. The creditor does not become a beneficiary. The executor does not hold the fund for the payment of some form of beneficiaries who are creditors. We're not talking about sequestration here. Now, in all of this, I want you to distinguish legal personality and capacity. And these words are laden with years of writing. After death, the legal persona of the deceased, even when represented by the executor is free to do less than the deceased could do prior to his death. 
So the legal persona of the deceased, even when represented by the executor, is free to do less. Now this common, indeed intuitive view, is that death somehow or other limits the legal capacity of the decurious. Death somehow or other makes this person able to do less. In that tradition it has been asserted, dead men can't sue. That's far, far too tersely stated to be accurate, and indeed Scots law adopts a more sophisticated approach. The general rule in Scots law as to the capacity of the deceased person, in my view, is threefold. First of all, a dead person unrepresented by an executor cannot carry out any legal acts which require a positive or active capacity, albeit that dead person has the passive capacity of an adult who is free from disability. So he's got positive capacity but not active capacity. Secondly, a dead person represented by an executor has the legal capacity to do anything that could be done by an able-bodied adult who is free from disability. Thirdly, the restrictions on what the deceased can do after his death arise from sources other than lack of capacity. They arise from a lack of rights and from increased obligation. Now, the passive, passive capacity of a deceased unrepresented by an executor, this is, broadly speaking, the gap period where somebody dies, they're dead. That's it. There's no executor appointed. The estate just seems to be vacant. Passive capacity. What on earth is it? It's the ability to accept rights. And it may sound rather highfalutin and obscure, but this is the capacity that allows the benefits in a life assurance policy to be paid instantly on death into the estate of the deceased. It vests instantly on death. It doesn't wait until the executor is appointed months later. It vests instantly on death. The estate, the person who owns that estate, the rights to that policy are vested instantly on death. They're not vested in the estate because it's a thing. They're vested in the person and the person is, the legal person is, the dead person. Now the passive capacity of a deceased person parallels that of the unborn child. One could object that the difference lies in the fact that a bequest or other right of succession cannot vest in a deceased person. If you leave a bequest to someone who predeceases you, it falls away. You can leave a bequest to an unborn child who's subsequently born and the benefit is for the child and that's valid. But the distinction does not arise from any difference in the passive capacities of each person, but the fact that a legally implied precondition of the right of vesting in succession is survivance. Put another way, this is a quirk of the type of obligation and has nothing whatsoever to do with the capacity to acquire rights. I can leave a bequest to my brother and require that it is paid to my brother and into his estate even though he predeceases me. I can require the bequest to be paid into his estate and that will be paid because I then expressly preclude the legal implied precondition of succession that he survives me. I can do that. There's nothing in law that will stop me from doing it. It's highly, highly unusual, but there's nothing to stop me from doing that. It effectively donates to his estate something that will be distributed according to his will. But his estate can accept what I give to him, even though he is predeceased. What's the active capacity of a deceased represented by an executor? When represented by an executor, the deceased retains his passive capacity to accept rights and gains active capacity. Active capacity entitles the deceased represented by the executor not only to acquire and hold rights, but to participate more fully in the acquisition grant assertion and transfer of rights. A frequently encountered active form of assertion of rights is participation in litigation to protect those rights. A dead person represented by an executor may initiate, pursue and defend legal proceedings as if he were a living adult person. In each case it does not matter whether the cause of the action arises before or after the death of the deceased. That said, albeit the deceased represented by the executor has the same capacity to participate in legal proceedings as a live adult person. His freedom to do so is limited by obligation. 
The relevant obligation comprises the duties to the beneficiaries to ingather and distribute the estate consistent with the laws of succession. Put another way, the executor is required to raise and defend legal proceedings only where it protects the interest of the estate and to refrain from doing so when it does not. Any other litigation may be challenged by the beneficiaries as inconsistent with the obligation owed by them, but it's got nothing to do with the capacity of the executor to raise the proceedings in the first place. Death, in some individual cases, restores or augments the capacity of the decuous. Death restores or augments the capacity of the decuous. This immediately appears to be counterintuitive in that death is frequently regarded as the ultimate disabling event. Nevertheless, this is not so, and death may be regarded as a means to liberty from disability. Prior to death, the decuous may have suffered from an incapacity due to non-age, the deceased could be aged two, for example, or mental disability. His affairs may have been administered in terms of the legislation relative to adults with incapacity. In other words, the live person simply had no ability to think. The live person may have been facile and liable to circumvention, and that's a doctrine in Scots law which applies, for example, to patients with Alzheimer's who have no ability to think for themselves and are easily influenced. On occasions, and even at the point of death, the person who has now died may have been so drunk or affected by drugs as to be incapable of carrying out legal transactions. Upon death, the general rule is that these lifetime restrictions on capacity all fly off. Death is indeed the great leveller, as the continuing personae of all deceased parties have the same capacity. After death, nobody is married. Nobody is a civil partner, and death terminates both marriage and civil partnership in the eyes of the law. Death is a sobering event. No death, no dead persons are incapacitated by strong liquor or drugs. Death, in, at least in the eyes of the law, is a land of sober spinsters, bachelors, widowers and widows. They may not be able-bodied, but as represented by the executor, all deceased persons are regarded as adults who can engage in legal transactions, even if they died at the age of two. The executor immediately can engage in legal transactions as if the two-year-old is an adult. In the words of our first institutional writer, Craig, and it's written in the handout, Neque enum mortui sunt in tempore, neque tempus eis post mortem currat. And that means time ceases to run for the dead who pass from it into eternity. Now, that said, not all inferences from this broad principle are true in Scots law. A deceased person, if a child at death, is not forever young. Instead, if underage at the date of death, after death, as I've just stated, he immediately becomes an adult. Only thereafter does he not grow old. And to that effect, he is frozen in time. In appropriate cases, and this is where it's easily demonstrated, the executor of a deceased may enter into a contract of sale for the deceased, with a view to distributing the proceeds to the beneficiaries identified under the law of succession, even though the child could not personally have sold the estate whilst alive. Mortal remains. Let's go on to that. We can cheer ourselves up with that topic. After death, the legal persona of the decuis is regarded as wholly separate from his mortal remains. Just as before death the decuis did not own his own body, so too after death the executor does not own the mortal remains of the deceased. They are extra commercium, in other words, outside the bounds of commerce and incapable of ownership. However, the person entitled to be appointed executor, in the absence of a special provision to the contrary in the will, has the right to deal with a funeral, and for that purpose, is, purpose has control over the remains. That seems perfectly sensible. Because if the executor does represent the deceased, the executor is the deceased. And surely to goodness the deceased has the right to organise his own funeral. However, whether that fits with modern social conditions is open to debate. And I know Heather has written on that very topic. Now, perhaps it's a stage at which I could stop and take some questions on this, if you'd like.